Welcome to No Apologies on Beck, where we are unafraid to speak the truth. I am your host, Rick Becker, our co-host, Lori Hintz. Happy to have you back in the studio. I'm happy to be back. Are you? Back. With well, the frigid temperatures, really? Are you? Are you? But really, are you? Are you really happy to be back? I, how, who can complain? Okay. complain with co-hosts like You're so kind. desk like this? <laughs> Right. Okay, so we've got, uh, I'm glad to be back. We've got a good show, um, some interesting things, electoral politics, a little stuff about mandates, um, we're hitting mailbag. Maybe talking about little tiny babies, some interesting stuff. <laughs> <laughs> like really little babies. Uh, yeah, we're, we're going to hit it right off the bat talking about the Electoral College because yesterday, of course, was the deadline for mm -hmm. the electoral votes to go in. I don't know if you did watch this. There was a live stream at the North Dakota Capitol. Uh, yesterday, I did, I did, and I watched it in real live time. And you could actually watch Secretary of State Al Jager, and the governor was there, and then our three electors were there in person. We actually started with only two electors to begin with, because one of the electors, uh, come to find out, Ray Holmberg uh, in Grand Forks, had COVID, so he had to uh -huh. recuse himself. So the other two had a procedure whereby they had to uh, go and they had to vote for another elector. So we got our third elector, who was John Trandum from Riley's Acres near Fargo. And uh, so he was seated, and that was, that was an interesting process. It was a lot of stamping sounds and a lot of sealing envelopes and a lot of signatures, a lot of signatures. But it was very worthwhile hmm. and very interesting to uh, watch the electoral process in North Dakota yesterday. Have three electoral votes. Correct. Each state has the number of electoral votes as they do uh, senators and congressmen. Right. So with our whopping single at-large congressman, that makes three, three for us. For, so if you're wondering why does North Dakota have so few, it's not really um, because of the size of our state or anything like that. It's for that reason only. Yep, yep that's right. So the total, the total for Trump versus Biden. Well, that is not necessarily set in stone because there were a lot of conditional votes that also went by. Okay, tell me about that. Okay, conditional so votes. conditional votes are when what happens is, is you've got a bunch of different states where they cast a conditional vote for Trump and Pence at the request of the Trump campaign, and that's kind of like a fail-safe in case things go awry and then they, they get seated later. So there were five different states whereby both electors for Trump, Pence, and Biden, Harris were filed at the same time, mm -hmm. which is a really weird situation. This is not normal. <laughs> this is not okay. what normally happens. So the conditional voting thing was really different. And yes, it is a lopsided one. If you Do you think it's over? Are you telling me that it's over? Is that what you're telling me? Yes. You think it's over? It's over. I do not think it's over. I don't think it's over. You're the eternal optimist. I, that is very true. I am the eternal optimist. But I also think there are a lot of other things at play yet. I do think that once... Uh, they get to Congress and they have to open those ballots. So that's going to happen on the 23rd. They certify them and then they open the ballots on the 1st, mm -hmm. I mean on the 6th of, of January. They will open those ballots. Well, all, all it takes is one senator and one congressman to object. Then they have to go into two hours worth of debate and they have to rectify things with this debate. And I, I think there's a lot that could really happen yet. So I'm not willing to give up yet, and I know I'm an eternal optimist. I realize that. I know that you think that the whole thing is said and done and it's over and we're going to have an interesting four years, but... I, I, I'm, I like maneuvering. Mm -hmm. I like political gamesmanship. Uh, I like to go against the odds. But there has to be a, a vision and a path. For me, I'm not seeing that. I don't think that they have... I, I do not think that the Trump campaign has articulated their path, and I think there is a reason for that. I, I think you can't let the other guys know what you're doing, otherwise they're going to manage to somehow thwart it, as in the election. You cannot tell me... Well, let's, let's hope that the Trump campaign lets us know what they're doing... Before the 6th? <laughs> or the January 20th. Well, that, and that's, that, hey, that's entirely possible, too. It could get down to the 20th before anything actually happens, legally or otherwise. I know. I know. You think that I'm nuts. If, well, yeah, I, I just, nothing good can come of it. If, if you don't have a clear-cut path, mm -hmm. and if you do... Here's, it, the, here's the issue. The issue is a, an illegitimate vote... And you can't have that for the country. You just simply can't have, you know, a, a huge amount, 80 million people wondering why 
things are not legitimate when so much information continues to come out day by day by day about fraud, irregularities, lawsuits, issues. There are uh, Michigan, um, in Michigan right now, they are still having hearings within their legislature, still trying to rectify things. And they, I, today they were supposed to talk to the Dominion uh, head, and I never got to see him on. And for some reason, it was delayed for some reason. And I'm not surprised that the Dominion uh, head of D Dominion <laughs> voting machines was not there. But I just think there's a lot that needs to happen yet. And I know that's vague, and I know I'm not giving you a lot of it's information. It's been vague from day one. I know. And it's been vague from every single proponent of the idea that Trump has a chance on a national level. Mm -hmm. And that's my concern, is there's there's all this vagary mm -hmm. and all this hope. And no specifics. And, and the problem is that that's not good for the country. Right. Because it, it it's leading people to believe that the outcome might be different if, in fact, there is not a clear path the outcome's not different, which increases the frustration. And I tell you, in, in, in the United States today, we don't need to increase frustration needlessly. Understood. So I hope they do. I mean, we're going we're gonna to find out. So 316 electors met yesterday, and they voted for President Donald J. Trump. 306 met and voted for Biden. That You add those together, you get 622. Seven states, including Arizona, Georgia, Michigan, New Mexico, Nevada, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, contested and um, they have contested and competing slates of electors and that totals 84 electoral votes so you take that 622 you subtract the 84 you get your 538 which is the original number mm -hmm. so the courts will sort it out in the coming weeks and this has happened actually before Hawaii in 1960 and of course Florida in 2000 so it's not like it hasn't happened before it's just been a long time it's been 20 years since it happened the last time so a lot of people have forgotten how contested that 2000 election was mm -hmm. um, the electoral college votes then are counted of course on January 6th during a joint session of Congress and the House of Representatives and Senate meet Vice President Pence will preside over that so if lawmakers can't agree on a set of electors the country will find itself in kind of uncharted territory which may prompt intervention from the Supreme Court and it's entirely possible. And so far, the Supreme Court is like, nope, 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 nope. I do not want to have anything to do with that. Understandably, um, they just they don't want to legislate that. They shouldn't mm. have to. However, um, the thing is, if the state delegations in the House get to choose, then the Republicans will be in a, an advantage of 30 sure. to 20. So. Now, there were no faithless electors this Correct. time around, right? Correct. So the thing is that when you go, there are 32 states and D.C., that are mandated, that where the electors are mandated to vote according to the popular vote right. in the state. Right. Uh, now there are circumstances where a, a, an elector can say, "Hey, I'm gonna, I'll, I'll cast my vote for this person." They get there and they cast their vote for another person. And I think there was a question of whether that would be at play um, to some degree, um, but it didn't, didn't go happen. that way. But also, it's because they have these alternate slates, which. Nothing's going to come of that unless there's something legal that happens in the states which upturn the perceived or you know final uh, verdict on what the popular vote is in that particular state. So those are kind of uh, you know a, a sidebar. Um, interestingly, the people that have been electors that have voted on a faithless basis, nobody has been jailed. Right. <laughs> um, they, they can do it, and they count, although there are many of those states, not all of them, I think 14, um, where they actually have a process in place that if an elector is going to cast a vote against the mandate that they vote for the popular vote right. winner, right. that they are immediately removed and a new elector is brought in. So that takes care of the concern about a, a faithless elector for those states. There are also two states that allow electors from different, uh, well, they're not bound necessarily. There's Maine and then there's Nebraska where yes. they allot. And you'll notice on the maps that you see there's stripes on um, Maine and stripes on Nebraska. That's, because, that's for that reason also. They're, they're, they have a little different allotment system for their electors in yeah. those two states. Arguably, that's a, that's a nice system that may very well represent the, the makeup of the voters' ideology and mm -hmm. preferences Correct. better. Right. Perhaps. But um, but also we don't really see at least too often that there those states are are sort of the, the hotbed of politics and where everyone they're not is really going, swing so. states. You're right. They yeah. don't, they are definitely not in the swing state era. But those states that are the swing states, those five to seven particularly, those are the ones where things are still going on, and we shall see what happens. So, I know. Lori, Lori, I know. Lori, he just Lori. like shakes his head, like listen, lady. <laughs> uh.
It's all right. Yeah. I so know. I'm going to uh, let's bring you back to Earth for our next segment. <laughs> okay. We will be back with some more interesting topics in just a minute. Please join us. Capital City Restaurant Supply is your one-stop shop for quality restaurant products for the large to small kitchens. Commercial grade restaurant and bar supplies, limb game processing equipment, refrigeration, dinnerware, and smallware. We sell everything including the kitchen sink for trusted manufacturers for the chef and all of us. Open to the public since 1971, we are veteran owned and North Dakota proud. Let us take care of your restaurant and home kitchen needs today by visiting us at 1414 Interstate Loop in Bismarck or on the web at CapitalCityRestaurantSupply.com. Hi, I'm Dennis Haugen, along with my sons Andy and Mike, and we're showing our support for wind energy in North Dakota. Wind energy has provided farmers like us with a steady stream of income that's not tied to the weather, like crops and cattle are. Another bonus is that wind farm owners are required to maintain the roads leading up to the turbines. Because of that, oftentimes these roads are the best in the county. Wind energy is good for landowners, it's good for the land, it's good for our economy, and it's good for North Dakota. For the greatest selection and full menu offering, it's the Four Season Restaurant and Ice Cream Parlor in Garrison. Succulent sandwiches, big breakfast served all day, and delicious desserts. Easy access in and out for campers and RVs. The Four Season Restaurant at the top of Main Street, Garrison. Are you a thrill seeker, sightseer, or day tripper? The Ford Bronco Sport SUV is built for you. Four Bears Casino is giving away a 2021 Ford Bronco Sport loaded with a ton of interior space, safari style roof, smooth suspension for any terrain, and easy to clean surfaces. Qualify now just by playing your favorite slots at Four Bears Casino. Double points on Sundays. Also get in on Super Senior Wednesdays, slot turning Thursdays, and hot seats on Wednesdays and Thursdays. Spin into Four Bears Casino and Lodge for chances to win. things in life are hard. That's why banking shouldn't be. Cornerstone Bank. You're back with no apologies on Beck. And now it's time for a segment we call Rick's Rant. Sometimes we rant, sometimes we don't. Mm -hmm. We got a pretty good Rick's Rant today. Uh, first oh. of all, the setup is, is that while you were on assignment, some things were going on with your establishments here in downtown Bismarck. Now you have two bars mm -hmm. down there, one atop the other. Yes. And, uh, did you get a phone call while Friday you were night? Gone? Well, yeah, I got a phone call from the manager. Friday night, the police came and shut us down um, between 11 and 11.30, something like that. And um, then it became a story, and it's been all around. People have been hearing about it. So, yeah, today's Rick's rant is a, a bit of a discussion about the mandate that Governor Burgum has put in place, a series of mandates under his executive order. And um, the logic, or lack thereof, for these mandates. We've got several mandates that were put in place initially to expire on December 14th. Now, those include the mask mandate that the state health officer put in place, which is for every, everything indoor, but also outdoors if you can't socially distance. Uh, Governor Burgum kind of uh, piggybacked onto that, added more to it uh, with social distancing in bars and restaurants, 
uh, with a 50% capacity maximum in bars and restaurants, 25% capacity maximum in larger venues. You can't be served any food or beverage while you're standing, only when you're seating. Uh, and that bars and restaurants have to close at 10 p.m. Now, there's a lot to unpack there because the logic in those mandates is missing. The scientific basis, the medical foundation that allegedly would be in place to put those mandates in place in the first place is nowhere to be found. If we look back at the early bar closing in Grand Forks several months ago, that was put in place after, in fact, the curve was going down in Grand Forks, which was shortly before the curve went back up. Governor Burgum claimed credit that the early bar closing was the reason. Clearly looking at the graph shows that it was not. And let's look a little bit more at the logic and the lack of consistency that we have for some of these mandates. What you had initially by Governor Burgum's own uh, North Dakota Smart Restart guidelines is that bars and restaurants, when we got to the level that we were at recently, were supposed to be at a 25% capacity. Now, if there was medical scientific basis for that, that's where you would stand. However, because some pushback, and from what I understand, a little bit of support from Lieutenant Governor Brent Sanford, who is, apparently has a head on his shoulders, um, it got increased to 50% instead of 25%. So what changed? The science didn't change. Medicine didn't change. It just is 50% because that's a little bit more palatable, and it is. You look at another aspect, 10 p.m. closing. Where did that come from? Dr. Burks likes it. I looked all over online. There's no, there's no basis for that. There's nothing. The idea is, well, gee, if people are at the bar later, they get more drunk. And if they get more drunk, they're, they're going to forget to put their mask up. But there's no science to that. It makes any difference whatsoever. Again, entire, entirely lacking. What about the sports practices? Do you know that in Governor Burgum's uh, ex executive order, the mandates that took place in addition to bars, restaurants, and the banquet facilities, high school sports were put on hold. Now, we know that younger people don't get affected by it. We know that it's highly unlikely for very young people to even transmit it. But if we assume that Governor Burgum had a scientific basis for saying we're going to put a hold on all high school sports and all practices, then we have to ask ourselves, when the, the parents of those high school students contacted their legislators, and they contacted the governor, and the legislators contacted the governor, and they pulled back and said, you know what, we're going to let high school sports start practicing two weeks earlier than what we said we were going to. Did the science change? No, it didn't. When Governor Burgum decided to extend the mandates that were supposed to expire December 14th, what happened with high school sports? They continued. They, they were able to, to come back. They were able to do what they needed to do, but the other stuff was left in place. So the question is, if what was taking place in our state that required these mandates still is in place such that it requires the bar, restaurant, and banquet facilities mandates, what happened where it doesn't require the high school sports? I can tell you it's because more parents are angry about the idea that their kids can't play sports. You can't, that's not science, that's political maneuvering. That's triangulation in a political sphere. Makes no sense at all. The, the mandates for high school sports are over. The mandates for bars and restaurants are over on January 8th. The mandates for masking in public and elsewhere are January 18th. Now, the governor said, that the mandates for bars and restaurants were going to be over sooner than for the rest of the mandates in the state because of economic concerns. Well, great. Thank you very much, Governor Burgum, for worrying about our economic concerns after you've been stomping us into the ground. But scientifically, medically speaking, tell me, how does it make sense that you can say, based on economic concerns, I'm going to do this, and I'm not going to do that. And based on parents being angry about their kids' sports, I'm going to do this. And I'm, it's not based in science. That's the problem. What, what are we supposed to believe? What am I supposed to tell my employees at the bar who make a living working at the bar and make greater than 50% of their income after 10 p.m. when you put these mandates in place so capriciously, so arbitrarily? 
You are throwing crap at the wall and you're seeing what sticks. When it works, seemingly, you take credit. When it doesn't, you ignore it, you move on to the next thing. We are sick of that. I had a phone call today from a bar owner who says that he's on the verge of complete bankruptcy and he's going to start keeping his bar open. And I said, good for you. Governor Burgum has no right to take your livelihood from you or from your employees. I had a call from a, uh, a mayor of a small town in rural North Dakota. Again, today, that person said it's ironic that we think we are taking care of things, somehow helping the COVID situation with bars closing at 10 p.m. But you know what he's seen? He's seen and he's hearing from his sheriff's department that there are a lot of barns and there are a lot of shops that at 10 p.m. on Fridays and Saturdays, there's 10, 12, 15 pickups parked at them. I wonder what they're doing. In Bismarck, we know full well that there are after party or after hour parties in various shops. People are not congregating less. They're not drinking less. Nothing is changing except that the people who rely on their livelihoods by working in bars and restaurants are not bringing home the income that they need. That's the only thing that's changing. This is having no effect on COVID. We have seen that readily, easily. It's in the charts, looking at the various states. Look at South Dakota with no mandates. Their curve is coming down it, essentially just like ours, with no mandates, just like Montana, who had a mandate before us, just like Minnesota, who had ridiculous restrictions well before us, these mandates aren't doing anything except hurting people. They are hurting the economy. They are hurting us mentally, psychologically, and morally. And it's got to stop. Well said. I have no arguments whatsoever with what you, I don't know how anyone can argue with, with what he just said. Well, I don't know wow. what we can look for next. Um, I, I think that we have to look at uh, a lawsuit. Uh, a person might say, well, geez, uh, January 8th is just around the corner. Well, the problem is- Not for people who are trying to make a living, exactly, it's not. It's exactly. still, I mean, look at how many weeks already. There are two components. One is that it, it, it should have happened already yesterday. Correct. Right. Um, and you've got You've got the holidays coming up, New Year's Eve coming up. You've got a lot of stuff like that we, that, that people who work in the industry should not miss out on. Exactly. But the second thing is we can't be complacent and just let it ride because we don't know when Burgum's going to put this back on us again. Right, right. The next time that there's a little, there's a little peak, maybe there's going to be one in early spring. And if he puts a, more mandates in place, then is, is that when we're going to do it? I mean, we, we've got to act now. I think that... Um, City, com city commissions and county commissions uh, need to stand up and they, and they need to uh, put in a resolution or they need to amend the contracts they have with sheriff's departments and so forth such that they ask uh, or require, where, whichever uh, is, is the case, that their local law enforcement not enforce these arbitrary mandates. And I, I think between that, between uh, uh, litigation, uh, and between bar owners and restaurant owners just staying open and the people of North Dakota patronizing those places, right. I think that's where we're going to see a change. Because when you just leave it in the executive's hands, that kind of power is very hard to relinquish, relinquish especially when they have this, the, the conceit of typical politicians that whatever they do is actually helping and it's for the betterment of the people because they have blinders on, they don't see the harm that they're doing. Right, they think it's for the common good when it actually is just decimating certain specific businesses. Yes. It's just, it's terrible. All right, so we are coming up on uh, another topic here and we'll be back right. with that in a moment. We're going to talk about what's going on in, <laughs> you think COVID restrictions are great here? How about uh, North Korea? Yeah, we'll talk about that next. Come back. stuff everywhere. It's so embarrassing. Ruins the neighborhood. Come on, humans. Let's get this fixed. 
Don't let your roof go to the dogs. Call America's best contractors for your free estimate. Need a new woof? After checking with the rest, go with the best. America's Best Contractors, 258-2412. Online at americasbestcontractorsincorporated.com. In southwestern and south central North Dakota, on any given day at any given moment, a Dakota Community Bank and Trust customer is logging in or signing on to do their online or mobile banking. We believe that community banking can blend both the past with down-home customer service in-house and the future with modern banking conveniences and technology for our customers anywhere, like here or here, all while honoring our long-standing tradition of community-first oriented banking here at Dakota Community Bank and Trust. My wife was diagnosed with uh, early stage Alzheimer's. We talked about it and we kind of decided we'd be a little bit proactive and try to start making provisions. So we started looking here and uh, even Tide worked out to be pretty much the perfect answer. I guess I, I didn't expect it to be so nice. The staff here were terrific. We enjoy it. They say, when the going gets tough, the tough get going. At OK Tire, we're here to keep you going. From Firestone tires and replacements to retreads and even Firestone tracks, we have you covered. Our certified Firestone experts are ready to get you back up and running, no matter if you're on site or in the field, saving you time and money. OK Tire, we keep the tough going. Now is the best time to plan for your 2021 farm equipment needs. North Dakota-based Summers Manufacturing is currently offering early order savings. Take advantage of big savings on North America's broadest tillage line, including the Super Colder Samurai and the innovative BRT Renegade, as well as the best-built, best-backed land rollers in the industry. Talk to your Summers dealer today or go to summersmfg.com to learn more about early order savings available on all Summers equipment. Welcome back to No Apologies on Beck. It is your after hours oasis of sanity. Mm -hmm. Sanity is good. Super important, uh, I'll, especially I'll cool in the year now. of COVID. This is an interesting year. Uh, if you think it's bad for bars in North Dakota, how about if you're bucking the trends in North, North Korea <laughs> instead of North Dakota? North yeah. Korea. Yeah, North to Korea. Uh, apparently, in North Korea, if you do not do as they say, they will just cancel you. Uh, we talked about cancel culture here before, but like literally cancel you, like execute you if you are not doing the correct thing with COVID restrictions. A North Korean citizen was publicly executed by authorities for violating emergency quarantine measures, according to Radio Free Asia. So pretty harsh, and they are kind of well known for making people disappear in North Korea, so. They are, they are indeed. Um, yeah, I don't, I th that's a place where probably my bar would not have been open after hours. Probably not. I'm, I'm just saying. Not good. So. Uh, they, they're apparently reportedly brutally killing people who break quarantine or break their rules and their quarantine rules. And uh, those with COVID placed in concentration camps, they can starve them to death. Uh, horror stories uh, from North Korea. Of course, they're not really coming out all that much because they're famous for kind of a, a little different narrative in North Korea. Uh, but it has been said that they are they are sharing that, and even though they share this huge border with China, they're saying that they do not have any people who are infected with the virus in North Korea any longer. I don't know that I believe that. Not a single case, no. Lori. <laughs> not a single case. What What is there not to believe? Well. But they are cracking down on human rights, right. there are, which which is nothing new. I mean, I, I, I think it's, it's just an, an, an extension of what they've been doing all along. Exactly. I mean, eight countries have said, have, uh, come at them pretty hard saying this is enough because they're taking people presumably with COVID even though they have zero cases and putting them in special camps you can call them concentration camps and uh, reported that there is a lot of starvation going on in these camps they really aren't providing any food 
a person with COVID or allegedly with COVID uh, is only going to get food if a family member happens to bring it to the to the perimeter of the camp. So pretty sad case. And yeah, a couple of a couple of uh, um, executions. One from I think he was bringing in some smuggled goods uh, via fishing or something of that nature. Mm -hmm. And then the the other guy was executed. He was a money money handler, and they were they were saying he was the reason that they were having uh, devaluation of their of their currency. I'm pretty sure that's probably not just one guy <laughs> having to do that, but just to guess it. Uh, it is just, it's a horrible situation. Um, the regime gave instruction, instruction to its people that external enemies such as the United States and South Korea are plotting to spread the virus to harm the highest dignity, he said. That's why the Kim regime is conducting quarantine measures abnormally against the cor uh, coronavirus. Abnormal. Sure. There yeah. are no normal measures dealing with coronavirus, just so you know, especially no. in the United States, but uh, particularly in North Korea. It's just a horrible thing. Uh, South Korea cast fresh doubt over the weekend on uh, North Korea's assertions that it has not recorded a single case, uh, while reports swirled of tens of thousands dying in secret quarantine camps run by the regime. It's just horrible. So, Yeah. They, uh, they have told their people not to play with snow. Uh, what? Yes, because if you, their, their contention is if you play with snow, you may contract COVID-19. This is, this is truth. Um, they also have banned all fishing and salt production at sea because they don't want seawater to become infected with COVID-19 because then anyone who touches seawater would get COVID-19. So um, despite having a wonderful education system, and a uh, government mandated universal health care provider mm -hmm. in their country, somehow I think they've got something maybe to gain, but with a better understanding of the virus. I can't even imagine living there and under those conditions, and I think that some human rights activists need to get over there and start uh, calling them out for some of the things they're doing. I just, you know, you can treat people with onerous rules, but then when you're locking them in places and not giving them food, it just seems outrageous to me that it would happen in this t year 2020 anywhere. Yeah. Well, and they had, they had a huge famine uh, over the course of a few years, 94 to 98, mm -hmm. and uh, millions of people starved to death. Uh, millions were trying to defect. Uh, even at that time, they didn't perform executions like right. they are now. Right. But at this point in time, they've had some natural disasters over the past uh, nine months, but they've, they've closed their border with China, which closes off a lot of trade, which closes off people's livelihoods, in addition to doing things like closing off fishing, sure. again, hurting people's livelihoods, uh, similar to, but perhaps slightly to a greater degree than Governor Burgum's uh, early bar closing. <laughs> Not exactly the same thing, but at the same time, onerous rules. <laughs> <laughs> right. Taking away people's right to um, make a living is, is, what, is what's happening there. So last month, um, Kim Jong-un uh, said during a massive military parade in Pyongyang that he was grateful no one in his country had contracted the bug. That's not true. Yeah. Well, and that, you know, some of this goes to why we can't... Uh, we, ha we have to take a lot of these statistics we get from certain countries, definitely North Korea, but also China, some of the South American countries, some of the um, Asian countries. When we are looking, Cuba also, mm -hmm. yep, when sure. we're looking and, and trying to compare uh, how the United States is doing on certain parameters, let's say um, uh, um, birth, death during childbirth, uh, neonatal mortality, uh, lifespan, things like that. We put ourselves, we rank ourselves according to other countries, right. but we don't, you can't verify that they're, they're accurate. None of their Certainly, numbers are right. going to be no, real. Right. So. North Korea, the, the uh, cumulative deaths per million in North Korea is zero, of right. course, because they have zero cases, allegedly. Uh, it's 3.3 in China, and it's 890 in the United States. Okay. So 3.3 versus 890, um, yeah. and I think that that does not have anything to do except with uh, accurate reporting, except where a place like North Korea and China wants to downplay how many cases they have, right. whereas for some reason in, Nor in, in the United States, we are upplaying 
which we've talked about and, and which our viewers, I would guess, know about when we're talking about fear. How, right. <laughs> how, how, we're, how we're looking at things, how, thing, how people were being uh, labeled as cause of death. Right. Uh, when we say that they died of COVID, we don't really. With COVID or from COVID. Right. That was a, a, con a huge contention for quite a while. Right. So for some reason in the United States, we are maximizing our numbers to the nth degree. Uh, and a person could, I think, make a very good argument that it's politically motivated. Uh, it's but actually almost propaganda if you think about it in terms of how much uh, media has pushed the numbers like repeatedly and oh. then elevated them. And, well, it's you know. absolutely propaganda. It's absolutely propaganda. And it's, it's partially about politics and it's partially about clickbait, uh, getting views, viewership. Right. Um, but it, it certainly was done by a lot of people as far as uh, exaggerating numbers to hurt Trump. And now I think it's continued to some degree because the people in power that like to exert their power over other people, the, these scare tactics, this fear mongering uh, establishes them as the savior of the people by establishing these various mandates. And so it, it's, it, it's crazy and I, I, it's, it's been so interesting to observe from not only a, like the, 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 the human psychology, um, both with when it comes to fear and concerns, but also uh, when it comes to power. Well, the bottom line is we are not North, North Korea in North Dakota or in, in the United States of America, but we are at least not executing people. I'm just happy to say that too. I think the, you know, the sheriff's departments can just rest easy. They don't have to go and pop people off. It's helpful, <laughs> super helpful. All right, we're going to be back with the mailbag. Mailbag. Get you soon. Howdy, folks. It's the Caroline Cafe. I reckon it's time you'll do for a hearty meal. So saddle up for the day with one of our hay boss and breakfast yeah. homemade soups. Fill your grill at a salad bar. Sink your teeth into our famous Caroline burger and barbecue ribs. Mm -hmm. Top it off with spur rattling pie with a calm roll that's sure to put a smile on even the toughest outlaws. Yeah. Shake the dirt off the boots each night and warm up with the game. Tell them about it, Stacy. I can't wait to see you at the county line. Since opening in Hebron in 1940, Dakota Community Bank and Trust has been your hometown bank. Our mission has been to provide modern banking convenience with old-fashioned hometown service. We've grown with the communities we serve. Through year-round events, countless sponsorships, and nearly 7,000 hours of volunteering each year. Learn more about our 80-year history at dakotacommunitybank.com. Jeez, what a mess. Look at that. There's roof stuff everywhere. It's so embarrassing. Ruins the neighborhood. Come on, humans. Let's get this fixed. Don't let your roof go to the dogs. Call America's best contractors for your free estimate. Need a new woof? After checking with the rest, go with the best. America's best contractors. 258-2412. Online at americasbestcontractorsincorporated.com. For the greatest selection and full menu offering, it's the Four Season Restaurant and Ice Cream Parlor in Garrison. Succulent sandwiches, big breakfast served all day, and delicious desserts. Easy access in and out for campers and RVs. The Four Season Restaurant at the top of Main Street Garrison. Are you a thrill seeker, sightseer, or day tripper? The Ford Bronco Sport SUV is built for you. Four Bears Casino is giving away a 2021 Ford Bronco Sport loaded with a ton of interior space, safari style roof, smooth suspension for any terrain, and easy to clean surfaces. Qualify now just by playing your favorite slots at Four Bears Casino. Double points on Sundays. Also get in on Super Senior Wednesdays, slot turning Thursdays, and hot seats on Wednesdays and Thursdays. Spin into Four Bears Casino and Lodge for chances to win.
Some things in life are hard. That's why banking shouldn't be. Cornerstone Bank. Welcome back to No Apologies on Beck. It is time for Mailbag, where we go over some of the stuff you guys send to us. Good, bad, ugly, whatever it might be, we'll take it on. Well, I was kind of excited that we got an actual email sent to me. That was super cool. I, I like that. It was from Grandma Rose, and Grandma Rose says, appreciated your segment on supporting the local police. So that was your, you, know, you want to give a little plug really quick for what you're doing with the local police in case oh, people didn't yes, know. Yes, very quick. So. Uh, it is Liberty and Prosperity Guild. You can find it on Facebook, and uh, we also have a GoFundMe page. It is an organization that's nonprofit. We are going to award a sheriff's department or police department with a $10,000 prize, if you will, that they can spend however they like. And the reason is that they are going to be a, a department which exemplifies doing their job as law enforcement while respecting the Constitution. So Grandma Rose saw this and so she, you can see she emailed and she said it is not enough to just back the blue. She said in Germany under Hitler the local police were transitioned to national police and uh, in his rise and fall of the Third Reich that national police became the SS uh, or Gestapo. So she says uh, it's important to also train and um, it's also important to honor uh, the local police and sheriffs to, and use the occasion to try to educate about the need to maintain and support local law enforcement. So not only back the blue, but support our local law enforcement too, which is exactly what your program yep. is doing. So she says, yep. I love your new program, um, especially appreciated the discussion of Bastiat too, she said. So thank you, Grandma Rose. Love Bastiat. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I mean, law enforcement is the same as legislators, is the same as everyone. Um, there are levels of awareness of what the Constitution is really about. And just like I would say that we really need to uh, be proponents of, of trying to ensure that legislators adhere to the Constitution and understand it while they do their job, it's likewise extremely important for law enforcement to fully understand it, take it into consideration when they are doing their job. A great amount of, of county sheriffs have come out and done videos and said exactly what they're about to do and uh, constitutional or otherwise so yep and i love that uh not so much well i i, I tend to be sort of anti-authoritarian but um but also because that's when you have the sheriff's departments coming out that's really where the the seat of law and law enforcement is supposed to reside closest to the people I love That's it. That's the total love grassroots. It, love it, love it. That really is the, the, the law enforcement there. Okay, Absolutely. so your next one is a, uh, a Facebook post, and it's a, a bit large. It's a, a lot, but maybe you want to yeah, highlight we, we a couple. Yeah, we highlighted a couple, but yeah, Nick says, Rick, I agree with you on the budget spending problems the state, parentheses, governor has. We can't continue to increase spending while revenue goes down. And Nick, I agree with that. We can't continue to increase spending while revenue goes down. Right. It is something we all understand when we look at our own checkbooks, Not when we look at our own <laughs> monthly budget, whatever it might be, that shouldn't even need to be said, but it is absolutely true. But then he says, the only thing we differ on is the K-12 spending. We need to look not at the total dollars per student, but the actual spending process. Smaller town rural schools are struggling and have lost money under the governor. Fargo can build schools that look like cathedrals, but rural schools struggle to provide basic transportation. That doesn't sound very equitable to me. Is that well, factual? See, I, I think <laughs> the, the, the problem is, as much as I, I am a firm believer in the buck stops here mm -hmm. for Governor Burgum on, on many issues, um, the, the whole rural and urban schools is, is a bit of a hot potato. Mm -hmm. There are formulas in place to try and make it equitable. The problem is property tax comes in and it kind of screws that up. Uh, additionally, when you have really small school districts, you are actually talking about greater number of dollars per student. Sure. Even though what filters to the student is seemingly then less than what filters through to the student in larger school districts. Mm -hmm because of course you have that baseline administration, building, you know, all that kind of stuff. And so I get what he's saying. I, 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 I totally understand it. It is something that we need to constantly look at and a one size fits all is not 
not the answer. Well, there's some large disparities in the, in the school districts in the whole state. There are. Like huge, huge differences. So uh, we're going to move on to the next one. This one kind of makes me laugh because uh, it's kind of a diss to our guest. And I, I, you know what, you are welcome to have your opinions about our guests. I guess um, we're welcoming all of them. But the, uh, the next one talks about chiropractors a little bit. So if we could put that up, Mr. Producer, and uh, so people can see. Thank you. So chiropractor is not a medical doctor. So I'm, you know, that, you get that all the time as a plastic surgeon too. And mm -hmm. I am just wondering, um, plastic surgeons and chiropractors, why can they get no respect? Did the pain start in their lower back? Best I can tell, it's a spasm between L4 and L5. Oh, are you a doctor? Yes, I'm a chiropractor. So no. <laughs> Yeah, no respect whatsoever. <laughs> oh, man. So, no. Um, now, I thought Dr. Nagel did a very fine job he in did. talking. And we just asked him uh, some suggestions on things that he could give people for doing their best with their immunity. And I thought he did a fine job of making some practical suggestions. He did a great suggestions. job. And sometimes when you don't have the correct opinion, it doesn't matter what your job title is because the person who is wanting you to say something different is just going to go up one level. Yeah. Because for him, well, he's not a medical doctor. For yeah. me, I'm not a, a specialist in infectious disease. If you are a specialist in infectious disease, you're not an epidemiologist. If you're an epidemiologist, you're not the top <laughs> epidemiologist. And um, Narek D, we know you're Karen D, so we, we figured out who you are. OK, so the last one is a, just a simple thank you. It's just a thank you. And I like this. It's short and sweet. Thank you, Rick and Lori. <laughs> Plain Jane Citizen here. Now, this tells me that we are doing a good job of making the complex a little more palatable and simple. Yep. Now, I don't know if she's saying she doesn't understand the political jargon generally, and so we're able to clarify it for her, or if she's saying even for us that maybe we're using political jargon. I don't know, but I'm glad she said that because we absolutely want to make it all understandable, right. readily accessible. Being in the legislature, if I'm using terminology, please stop me. I will. Me. You believe stop me. me and, yep. Nope, not a problem. I'll ask. Mm -hmm. uh, when we come back, we're going to talk about little tiny babies, as I alluded to earlier, when we come back here at No Apologies. Howdy folks, it's the Caroline Cafe. I reckon it's time you're due for a hearty meal. So saddle up for the day with one of our hay boss and breakfast yeah. homemade soups. Fill your grill at a salad bar, sink your teeth into our famous Caroline burger and barbecue ribs. Mm -hmm. Top it off with spur rattling pie with a combo that's sure to put a smile on even the toughest outlaws. Yeah. Shake the dirt off the boots each night and warm up with the game. Tell them about it, Stacy. I can't wait to see you at the county line. Hi, I'm Dennis Haugen, along with my sons Andy and Mike, and we're showing our support for wind energy in North Dakota. Wind energy has provided farmers like us with a steady stream of income that's not tied to the weather, like crops and cattle are. Another bonus is that wind farm owners are required to maintain the roads leading up to the turbines. Because of that, oftentimes these roads are the best in the county. Wind energy is good for landowners, it's good for the land, it's good for our economy, and it's good for North Dakota. Capital City Restaurant Supply is your one-stop shop for quality restaurant products for the large to small kitchens. Commercial grade restaurant and bar supplies, limb game processing equipment, refrigeration, dinnerware, and smallware. We sell everything including the kitchen sink from trusted manufacturers for the chef and all of us. Open to the public since 1971, we are veteran owned and North Dakota proud. Let us take care of your restaurant and home kitchen needs today by visiting us at 1414 Interstate Loop in Bismarck or on the web at CapitalCityRestaurantSupply.com. My wife was diagnosed with uh, early stage Alzheimer's. We talked about it and we kind of decided we'd be a little bit proactive and try to start making provisions. So we started looking here and uh, even Tide worked out to be pretty much the perfect answer. I guess I, I didn't expect it to be so nice. The staff here were terrific. We enjoy it. They say, when the going gets tough, the tough get going. At OK Tire, we're here to keep you going. From Firestone tires and replacements to retreads and even Firestone tracks, we have you covered. Our certified Firestone experts are ready to get you back up and running. 
No matter if you're on site or in the field, saving you time and money. OK Tire, we keep the tough going. Now is the best time to plan for your 2021 farm equipment needs. North Dakota-based Summers Manufacturing is currently offering early order savings. Take advantage of big savings on North America's broadest tillage line, including the Super Colder Samurai and the innovative BRT Renegade, as well as the best-built, best-backed land rollers in the industry. Talk to your Summers dealer today or go to summersmfg.com to learn more about early order savings available on all Summers equipment. Welcome back to No Apologies on Beck. We are at our final segment tonight already. The time flies. It does. And as Lori said, we are going to talk about tiny babies, or the term I, use, I learned in medical school is embryos. Embryos. Not only are embryos tiny, but they are apparently able to be frozen cryogenically for 27 years. And then, because, this, is, this is just such a great story. So Molly Everett Gibson. Uh, was born from an embryo that was frozen on, uh, in October of 1992, only 18 months after her mother, Tina, who is 29 years old, was born mm -hmm. in April of 1991. So 27 years, this was an embryo frozen, and then she becomes this baby, and the girl enters the history book, says the longest frozen embryo known to result in a live birth, and remarkably, um, her 20, October 26th arrival broke the previous record held by her sister, Emma Wren, who spent 24 years on ice before her delivery in November of 2017. It's just amazing. Uh, National Embryo Donation Center Lab Director Carol Sommerfeld told the Post, as long as the embryos are maintained correctly in the liquid nitrogen storage tank at minus 396 degrees, that's chilly, mm. uh, we feel that they may be good indefinitely. So science is an amazing thing it with is. regard to embryos and babies. Made me think about some of the other uh, advances that have been made with neonatal and NICUs and, and how you can have babies earlier and earlier. Now, when I was pregnant with my babies, the, the big magic number used to be 24 weeks, 24 weeks. Well, that mm -hmm. has kind of been blown out of the water now, too, with just medical technologies where they can, you know, babies are viable for longer. They're doing things with surfactant. They're doing things with their lungs. And, and um, it's, it's amazing how technology has aided in making parents become parents. Yep, absolutely. So, so frozen embryos, um, I mean, <clears throat> if, if someone's asking, well, what, what the heck are they talking about? Um, frozen embryos typically would come from in, vit in vitro fertilization. Correct. So if you're having a hard time conceiving, you go to the doc and, and uh, they stimulate the, the mom to go into ovulation, they, take, they pluck a couple of eggs, maybe a bunch of eggs, right. take the father's sperm, and then presto changeo, you've got some embryos. And then you plant the embryos into the mom's uterus and baby Correct. is made. And so the thing is though that you, you do this for a lot, you create a lot of embryos, you put some in and then the others are left there to try again. But the thing is, if you get pregnant, maybe you get pregnant a couple times, maybe you have octuplets. Right, it could happen, uh, no question. Then you're, then you're saying, so I guess I don't really need all of those frozen, those, those, those embryos Implanted from in embryos. vitro. Right, so right. they freeze them and then what happens? Well, it, at some point they're gonna decide either they, they discard them, mm -hmm. which uh, some might consider abortion, Right. Um, they may, put them up for adoption, they may keep them frozen, whatever it might be. But that's what we're talking about with frozen embryos. It's not like you go to, you know, Walmart in the frozen embryo section. Uh, <laughs> right. it's, a, it's a very, but Thanks I- Thanks for the visual of that though, yeah. that's great. <laughs> uh, as I understand it, there are about 400,000 frozen embryos sitting around right now. That's amazing. It's pretty rare that tank malfunctions happen, but um, they'll happen if the temperature in the tank fluctuates, which can lead to potential loss of the embryos too, which mm -hmm. is troubling. But I, I just think that it's phenomenal that a baby born after 27 years cryogenically yeah. frozen. I just thought the story really struck me as an amazing thing. And the fact that her sister had the previous record, and I don't know what that conversation is gonna be like when they're a little older right. and by the way, yeah. <laughs> now the, um, I think one of the things that's very interesting about this story is that the reason they opted to adopt a frozen embryo is because the dad has cystic fibrosis, and the mom was found to be a carrier of the gene, so their offspring would have had an extremely high chance 
of also having cystic fibrosis. So I find that interesting for a couple of reasons. One, it's amazing that, that uh, what science can do. Yeah, genetic testing right there. Um, but, but secondly, you know, the next step in science is going to be that if you find you have cystic fibrosis, you'll be able to make your own embryos and determine which of those embryos is going to have cystic fibrosis right. and discard those embryos. So that's going to bring about a whole new ethical, ethical dilemma. dilemma. Yep, exactly. exactly right. um, and as it stands now that the church, the Catholic Church in particular, is not a big fan of this, um, they, they have a couple of concerns. One is they don't want this in vitro and this uh, frozen embryo to, to supplant the uh, act of marriage, if you will, right. um, uh, conceiving, the, conceiving the baby. Um, they, they feel that that's a, an integral part uh, to marriage, and you can't take that out of marriage. And then, of course, the, the other part, the big part that, that we're all aware of, is you create all of these little tiny human beings, right. and then if it, you obviously can't use them, do you freeze them forever? They're discarded. Is that equal to abortion? One of the big ethical dilemmas I, I, I remember that was proposed for people to kind of think out is you run into a lab that's burning, there's a, a two-year-old child crying in one of the rooms, right. and there's a suitcase with 30 frozen embryos. Right. Who do you survive? Who, 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 do, you who do you rescue? Right, right. right. So very, very interesting uh, moral dilemmas that this brings up. I think it's wonderful that science can help people and bring them happiness. But it's, uh, a, it's a slippery slope, as you said, too. The other thing is you do not want to have to start choosing designer children either and discarding embryos as well. So that's important. Right. Well, and have you considered that it is very possible that a person could give birth to their own sister or their biological aunt. Right. They, they literally could. That yes. blows me away. Yep. That blows me away. Tomorrow, well, on the next show, we will have an in-studio guest who is doing good and rewarding good behavior, and it's a state officer. So join us then. And stick around for No Filter with Debbie next on Beck.